I'm Diane Barrett. It is International Women's Day, and it's March 8th, 2022. And I'm here with Bonnie Gibfried. Yes. Okay, so thank you, and you're in New York. I am on Long Island, New York, and huh. it's actually gorgeous. I was out in the front trying to get things organized so it looks peppy for St. Patrick's Day and Easter and spring. So who's Irish? No one. It's just we celebrate everything here. We just celebrate, celebrate all everything. holidays. Yeah, Thank well, being, being an interfaith minister, we honor everybody. Mm -hmm. And so how did you get involved in the ministry? Well, it's really interesting. Um, I Don't never feel like thought, you have to rush. We have all afternoon. Yeah. Um, I never thought of honestly being a very religious person. I mean, in the beginning with my mom, we were bounced from church to church to church. And uh, in school, I had a lot of uh, Jewish friends. So I went to temple with them and they came to church with me. And we started off in a, a Bible church uh, and then did the Protestant, the Methodist, the Catholic, and so on and so forth. So I was bounced all over the place as a kid. So I had a variety of exposure to different religions really early on. And was that your mother's choice to try different? Mm, yeah, because uh -huh. my um, my father was Catholic mm -hmm. and my mom was uh, Methodist. Mm -hmm. was and anybody Jewish. Yes, we have Jewish uh, on in our family. So uh -huh. uh, it was really interesting because my father wanted us to uh, go to the Catholic um, church which is St. Anthony's in Oceanside. Um, and he decided he didn't want to go to church with us. So at that point, my mom made a decision that she was going to go to different churches. And she went back to the church that my grandmother and great-grandmother uh, lived around the corner from when they first came to America. Where did they um, come from? Uh, England. England. Huh. Yep, Weymouth, England. No, I'm interested in your process of making the determination to become a minister. One of the things that we're doing was, with this it project. It was never really on my scope. Uh -huh. My grandmother, um, being Presbyterian and Methodist, mm -hmm. and coming over from England, read the Bible. Um, you, have, you have siblings that are going with you for this? For all these my, my brother at the time, my brother has passed. Uh -huh. But he was part of your church going? Yes. <laughs> yes. My brother was two years younger than me. So uh, the poor kid grew up in my shadow of, uh, oh, you're Bonnie's brother. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I felt bad for him because I was the scholar. And the athlete and... Is there anyone in your family gay besides yourself? No. No. I'm it. <laughs> well, no, I shouldn't say that. Uh. My, my, <laughs> cousin, my cousin in um, California, uh, her and her wife have been together for many, many years. Huh. So I'm, be aware now, this is a legacy project and you're going to be in these archives forever. Yeah, you know... Yeah, that, isn't that something? So tell us about 9-11. Were you working? Um, um, that's occupation? Kind of how, that's how, kind of how I got to going to seminary and everything. Mm -hmm. um, like I said, I wasn't a very religious person. Um, I went to a Catholic college and made my confirmation, all that, uh, when I was late, much later in life in college. And... I was betwixt and between with, I was done with social work because social work was You were not a social going. worker at that time? I was a senior case manager for Catholic Charities. Oh, okay. So I've been community minded all my life and I was involved in my community because my family, <laughs> 
was involved with the volunteer fire department and my mom was in the uh, auxiliary and I lived next to the fire department my whole life. Wow. With whistles blowing and everything else. And I swore up and down, I would never ever become a firefighter EMT. I wanted to get so far away from the fire department because that was my life. My grandfather was a chief of Oceanside Fire Department. My father was the chief. Really? Uh-huh. My whole family was involved in the fire department. <laughs> in the fire department. So I really wanted nothing to do with that. So like I said, being community oriented, by the time I got into junior high, I was very active with Project Cy- Cyrus, which was special so handicap. What point in your development where you were of your sexuality? Um, at that point, I was not out. I was exploring at that point. Um, I had a friend up the block that, you know, we had kissed and we had cuddled and snuggled together and, um, felt great coming from my background, you know, Mm -hmm. German staunch and, you know, not touchy feely. No. So then like for myself, when I was in first grade, I was aware that I was intrigued with a nun who was teaching me to read uh, with her cleavage. So mm-hmm. that did you have those kinds of inklings prior to really coming out? Or? Oh yeah, I knew. I knew not to talk. Probably about it. The, by the end of junior high, mm-hmm. I knew there was something different uh-huh. because I was not interested in the boys. Um, my friends tried to set me up on dates and when we had dates, um, I had them in the pizza parlor with me because I just had no desire to be with a guy. It was really interesting because I was also, um, in this whole process of, of going through things, I was, uh, trying to be clean and sober. Yeah. I, my father and my relationship was very tenuous. Um, I was actually taken out of the house as a ward of the state at 15 because of uh, (laughs) abuse and the drinking and his drinking, not my drinking. Mm -hmm. Uh, No one knew. I kept that under wraps really, really tight. Who reported the abuse that you were suffering with to the state? I did. My father went after the whole family. He was drunk and went after the whole family. He nearly uh, broke my mother's back and my brother's jaw. And I I got out of the house and um, I called the police up the block. Mm -hmm. So I ended up getting probation for that. Really? How old were you? I was 15, going to go on 16. So, yes, I got probation because I was violent because I almost broke my father's jaw much for defending yourself i was defending the family right so did that abuse start when you were really young yes Uh uh-huh i'm sorry that's awful it's okay i know my father and i made peace before he he passed because i ended up becoming his caretaker he got cancer and my mother couldn't handle it so um i became his caretaker so before He passed in his own way. He said, you know, I would have done anything in the world for you. And that's the best he could do. How'd that make you feel when he said that? It was sad that it came so many years later and he didn't know who I was, didn't know what my accomplishments was. Mm -hmm. And his drinking um, cost me my scholarships at college. I lost my scholarships because they told that my father told them uh, a month before that I had moved to Texas. He didn't want to see me achieve because I was a woman. So, so. Tell, tell us about 9-11 for you. What happened? What were you doing? Um, 9-11, mm-hmm. I was dispatched to the World Trade Center on that infamous day. Um, it was a gorgeous, absolutely gorgeous day. Really? And What was your occupation at that time? Um, on nine, on nine 11, I was a EMT and a volunteer firefighter. 
So my position, I had just gotten full-time uh, status through my employer and I was with my work partner at that point, almost a year. So she was the veteran and younger than me. And I was, <laughs> I was the old bag trying to learn, you know, the, the ropes. But um, one of the thing with Jen and I, was we were both volunteer firefighters. So we had the commonality there. And when you're on the streets of New York, you need to know your partner is going to have your back. And we worked very well together. On 9-11, um, as usual, we had an early tour. And my tour, I had to be in by 4.30. So my, my infamous ploy was if the SST passed me, I was late for work. <laughs> so uh. when the SST came in, because I live by Kennedy Airport, if I saw or heard the SST, I was way late for work. So, so what was I the SST? Be, um, that is the airplane that came from England, the uh, supersonic okay. uh, air jet. Mm -hmm. okay. It no longer exists because of uh, issues that they had with it. But um, I love the early mornings because it was peaceful. It was quiet. I didn't have to deal with the traffic. And on that day, um, my uh, work partner happened to be late. And that kind of set up the day for saving our life. But she was late? Uh, she was late, yes. That was Jen. And, huh? That was Jen. That was Jen, yeah. Okay. Jen, Jen was late for work. So um, our normal time to be on on our um, we call it 89. That's the position you stay in wherever you're placed in the New York uh, 911 system. So that's the corner or the space that you'll be in for that time until they move you. So I could be in any borough of New York, depending where they needed the ambulance. Um, with our job, we were in a voluntary hospital because the fire department in New York cannot handle all of New York city. So they need to subcontract, um, different entities. And I was part of the voluntary hospital system that was under the 911 system. So for us, her being late <laughs> really just added to the fact that it was something that saved our life that day because we should have been on the road by 5.30 and we were delayed because when you get to your ambulance, you have to 800. That means you need to know where all your equipment is. You need to make sure that all your radios work. You have to check your regular bands. We have two bands that we work off of. And then you have to make sure you have the old city band. So that's the one that we ended up using on 9-11 because you now are incorporated with all of New York City. So now it's close to 7, 7.30. So she had flipped to a, a radio station and it was one of the stations where they, they banter off each other and they joke around. And the guy goes, the World Trade Center was just hit by a plane. And I'm like, that's not even funny. Turn that shit off. So at that point, she's like, no, 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 they, they're not kidding. I'm like, come on, this is not even funny. It had to be less than three seconds. Our radios went crazy. And we looked over to the left and there was a humongous plume of smoke coming out of the Twin Tower. I looked at her and I said, that doesn't look like a Cessna. I said, that, that, that's a lot of smoke. She's like, oh, don't worry about it. It's a Cessna plane. It's probably gas and everything else. And you know, we're firefighters. So we're going back and forth with the banter. And as we went through the tunnel, when we came out of the tunnel and went down towards South Street Seaport, we turned and there was people running all over the place. 
there was a cloud of smoke and at that point the unit in front of us turned down towards the south street seaport the debris was coming down um and it just seemed like everything went silent at that point you really couldn't hear the sirens you were really really paying attention to what was going on you were just driving and i i was driving that day and and jen you didn't have was, any communication coming into you the the radio you couldn't even hear anymore right. and at that point we did not know the second plane had hit so um a police officer started yelling and screaming you know where are you supposed to be you know go to where you're supposed to be and it's like well we're supposed to be on west and Vesey. he's like well go there and it's like well where is there he's like you go down you go around the hoop and 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 you're on on west so this is all before the GPS systems, right? Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Uh, <laughs> yeah. So I, we, I didn't have GPS on my phone at that time at all. So I don't even uh, know if it existed. Yeah. I, it may have just started. Right. But I um, think it tells you how much we rely on the GPS stuff. Exactly. Exactly. So um, it was like nothing I have ever seen in my life before. Anything that you've seen on a disaster movie, a war movie, yeah, it was 10 times worse. The only thing was we weren't being shot at. As we went up West Side Highway, I looked to Jen and I'm like, this is just not adding up. And we're looking back and forth and saying to each other, it's like, this isn't right. And as we were going, I started seeing debris. And at one point I slowed down. She goes, why are you slowing down? It's like, I just ran over someone hip and leg. She goes, it's a mannequin, it's a mannequin. I said, no, it was someone's hip and leg. She goes, just keep on going, keep on going. So as we're going up, there's fire all over the place. There's debris all over the place. And we didn't know how much damage there was until we got to the intersection of West and Liberty and we were stopped by a firefighter who proceeded to say, back the ambulance up here and get your stuff together. And I'm arguing with this firefighter because most people know in New York City, um, the manhole covers blow up. <laughs> blow up? Huh. Yeah, yeah. And he wanted to put me on a manhole cover, over a manhole no cover. And I'm like, huh. I'm, I'm not going on a manhole cover. It's just not happening. Um, manhole covers are known to blow up in New York City. What and that's, that? Huh? Why do they blow up? Uh, causes explosions between uh, heat and gas and lack of maintenance, so on and so forth. So we argued for a little bit. And again, that delayed us again. This whole day has been a delay, 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 delay. So finally, I said to the firefighter, get out of my way. I'm not parking near the manhole cover. I'm parking down further. So that put us just in front of Financial One and the South Pedestrian Bridge. At that point, we got out of the ambulance, Jen and I, and we started getting our equipment together. And Captain uh, Karen DeShore from the fire department said she needed someone to go into the South Tower. Jen looked at me, I looked at Jen, and we started scrambling to get everything on the stretcher. And I think that's the first time we both looked up and was like, holy God. So we got everything on our stretcher and we were putting put into a holding area to go across the street to the South Tower. So at that point, we're looking at our situation and we're looking up and there are people jumping and you're hearing loud bangs 
And we didn't put two and two together. It was the people's bodies hitting the ground. And then Captain DeShore said to us, you're next, you're going in. Okay. So we have all our equipment and just envision a garbage heap that you have to pull a stretcher through with all kinds of obstacles that are on fire. Um, vehicles that can blow or shoot their bumpers out and kill you. Uh, you have people who are jumping, you have debris, and we're running across from West Side Highway and Liberty to the lobby of the South Tower. Still don't remember a lot of stuff, and to this day, I do not remember a lot of stuff from that day. But at that point, we were in going into the South lobby when Chief Wells uh, told us that we would be taking three women across the street, one of them um, having mobility issues and had a scooter. And at that point, both Jen and I took our helmets off, which is like a no-no. You don't do that, especially with falling debris. And we told the women, strap it on tight. Whatever you do is look straight. Don't stop. No matter what you hear, don't stop. Keep on going. The woman on the stretcher, we told her if she wanted her you know, to be covered up so we could protect her face and everything else. Um, she said, you know, she would cover up and, and we told her the same thing. Just look forward. We have you. We're going to take you across the street and then we're going to, you know, make sure that you're on your way safely. So, uh, so Chief Wells at that point said on the count of three, you're going. So it was like one, two, yeah, and we and were you, on our way. Uh, we were on our way. We were now going from the South Tower lobby across the street, past the uh, South Pedestrian Bridge, onto the other side of Western Liberty. And you, you just, you couldn't imagine what we were going through with the debris. We got the two women to the other side and they gave us our helmets back. We put our helmets back on. And at that point, the woman who was on the stretcher said, my mobility, you know, scooters on the other side. And we're like, oh my God. So Captain Karen DeShore sent another person over to get it. And we told them, you have to go down south, away from here. At that point, I don't think we honestly took in the enormity of what was going on because we're trained to learn lose our fight or flight, you know, response. Uh, if we didn't have that, we couldn't do our job. And you just heard bam, 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 and it's like. It was crazy. It, it was something that I hope nobody ever has to endure. And at that point, we were just about to go in when Captain DeShore said, it's going to blow. We scattered like a bunch of cockroaches. We went all over the different place to get away. And no sooner did she say that, the ground shook and the tower blew. And at that point, we ran towards um, the marina, the South Marina. Well, actually it was the North Marina first. So we ran towards the North Marina and debris, tons of, it, it sounded worse than a train or an explosion. And this is trailing you as you're trying to not only save yourself, but you know, find a safe spot so you're not going to get buried by this stuff. You're Jen and I together during all this. Uh, Jen and I still stayed together. That's yes, 
Yes. Um, that's one of the things I said. You don't lose your partner. You don't go anywhere without your partner. That is just a written rule. Unless your partner gets swept away, blown away, whatever, um, you're, you're going to have your partner by your side. So we ran to this space uh, on the outside of Financial One, which we thought was an entrance in, but it was a part of the facade to the building. And that's where we got buried alive the first time. We were buried probably four floors, at least worth of debris that came from the tower. And we were in that void were with other people. And the breath, are, you it was getting difficult to breathe because it was heated material that we were in. We all got hit by the material. Um, thank God we didn't get cut or anything, but some people had gotten cut. And at that point, the people in front said, does anybody have anything to, to break this window? And we handed up, everybody was handing up whatever they had, you know, in their hands and, and the next thing I heard was pop, pop, pop. And it's like, what the hell is that? You know, I had already said my goodbyes. Were you trapped in? We, we were trapped in less than a eight by 10 space. And there was about 12 of us. And, you know, before the pop, 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 we heard, we, I basically made peace with my higher power, God, whoever you call your higher being or not, um, to watch over my family and, and to take care of those who were out there. Because I knew I was gonna die. And a lot of people ask me, was I afraid? I don't think we had time to be afraid. You just knew it was eminent because literally you could not breathe. It was worse than trying to suck air through a straw. And when we heard the pop, 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 all of a sudden we heard shattering of glass and then we were being ripped through the, um, the opening into Financial One. Um, Officer McGinn, took his secondary pistol that he had on him, put it to the bottom of the glass and shot the glass out. And it's a miracle that it broke because the panes in these well, buildings that, right? were more than six inches thick. Wow. And there's more than one pane and it should have never broke. Mm -hmm. So uh, we got a financial... We got into Financial One at that point, and you heard the the uh, fire alarms going off. You couldn't see anything. The dust you were inhaling, you were inhaling whatever was in the air. So you were and able at to that walk. point, huh? You were, walk, you were walking. We were standing there quite a bit to try to figure out, like what was out because we were in a building we didn't we weren't yeah. familiar with so uh again like i said we were both volunteer firefighters and it that just kicked in we grabbed the wall and we started feeling the wall around and all of a sudden we got to the uh entrance of financial one open the door <laughs> cloud of dust yeah, couldn't see anything and you're just looking at a wasteland. It is absolutely, you can't see the sun. There is debris all over the place. There's smoke all over the place. And you're trying to orient yourself in a place that you have no idea where you are. At that point, we started walking towards the water. We didn't know we were walking towards the water but we figured we had to, to move away from where we came because that's what you do. You go to the place that you don't want to be where Boom was. So we're going opposite. 
So as we were walking uh, across the street, we saw a MERV, which is an emergency vehicle. It has emergency extra equipment from the fire department that you can get. We had lost our bag, um, our tech bag, and um, anything that we were carrying at that point. We had our radios, we had our, oh, had our helmets still. So um, oatmeal, good thing you got that oatmeal in the morning. <laughs> yeah, it's certainly very true. But um, the Merv, we went in and the guy's like, you can't take anything. And it's like, tough. We're taking what we want. And at that point, we knew if someone was in cardiac arrest, we weren't saving them. There's no way we could have saved them. So we took another tech bag. We actually took two tech bags and uh, we started proceeding back towards the water and all of a sudden we heard a huge explosion again. <laughs> he dropped the bags and ran into the parking garage, into the gateway parking garage. The ground shook worse than the first time. We had no clue it was the second tower that was blowing up. And we ducked into the parking garage office by the entrance of the parking garage and because I was bigger than Jen I just shoved her in a corner and we shielded each other because when you're a volunteer firefighter you're you learn different areas of the building that's secure and sturdier than others so we went into the back corner of the office because we knew at least there would be a beam or support there the front wouldn't have support so after the rumbling and the crashing and everything happened, um, Jen found a flashlight and we started looking around. You couldn't see anything. Now there's debris all over the place and dust and everything else. And we came out of the office and we heard a uh, officer identify himself as I'm a New York City police officer. I need to know how many people are in here. So everybody went one at the same time. So it's like, For one uh, minute. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's not going to work. So finally we took turns and there were seven of us that were buried alive in, in the parking garage. And Jen said, follow our voice. Cause we're by the entrance. We're going to have to dig out, but we're by the entrance. So finally we reunited and the officer said, follow me. So we dug ourselves out and we went outside. Do that? And Just with your hands? Just hands. Yeah. yeah. Move debris, everything. I, I'm surprised that we were not cut up worse than, than we were. We had mm -hmm. scrapes and bruises and everything, but it, we should have had a lot more injuries. And like I said, it was a miracle. And um, I definitely believe in miracles. So at that point, the officer took us through some wooded area and we got to the water and that was the first time we saw the light of day. And we're looking around and people what running. What time was away. that? Huh? What time was that, do you think, approximately? That's really hard because I still don't have recollection of, of times and everything else. Yeah. It's like I thought the North Tower went down before the South Tower. And it's like I had to read time and time again that the South Tower went down before the North Tower. And it's like, that's what I mean. There's so many gaps in that day, not only because of the post-traumatic stress and you know the mind can't handle that, but I was also injured. So um, you're, you're trying to deal with everything, right? Yeah. At that at that point, when the officer um, got us down, he took off. And we started um, gathering what we could. And uh, Jen had uh, one of the bags, the EMT bags, uh, she had picked up when we had gone out of the uh, parking garage. So we had something with us. And we started treating people and telling them, go the opposite way, go the opposite way, go down towards this, the South Marina, go, out, go down to the Marina, go down to the Marina. So uh, we re started redirecting people and then the uh, harbor boats started showing up. And we started 
putting everybody into different categories to go on different boats. If they needed an immediate, we put them in a smaller boat so we could go straight across um, the uh, Hudson. And at that point, I started having difficulty breathing. And I said to Jen, I, I think I'm gonna have an asthma attack. And she goes, okay, well, you better hold on. So she disappeared and came back, not only with oxygen, with an extra bag and a sanitation cart, they pick up the garbage pails with in the park. And I'm like, I just looked at her and she's like, just suck on this. And it's like, okay. So I took an albuterol treatment. I felt a little bit better. So we kept on treating people. And then at that point, um, another um, captain uh, showed up on the scene and said, we have to go down south. And we all what got- What was your injury? What was your injury? You said you were injured. Um, I didn't know about my injuries until much later, but the, okay. the asthma was the first thing. That's pretty usual, actually. Evidently, my shirt was full of blood and everything else, and I didn't feel anything. I didn't think I was cut. So um, at that point, the um, captain took us down. Sorry, chief. Chief took us down to the south, south uh, marina. Jen is driving the sanitation thing, telling everybody to move, go the other way, go the other way, go the other way. <laughs> and as um, we're as we got to the South uh, Marina, we hear that there's a possible threat of a gas explosion. How I jumped from the ground on top of the seawall, which is quite a bit, I just turned and I said to the chief and, and to Jen, we got to go. Because if there's an explosion, there's going to be a wave and it's, it's going gonna, it's gonna to kill us. Besides the fact that everything's blowing up. So at that point, um, the chief said, I'm going back for my boys. And I said, no, you're not. He <laughs> said, uh, you got kids at home? He goes, yes. I said, there's nothing we can do here. We both have grandmothers, you got kids, we got to go. So I jumped off the seawall and then we went down onto the platform this, of the South Tower and that's where the NYPD uh, Marine units were. We got onto the, the um, boat, we started going out of the uh, South Marina and that's the first time we saw the magnitude of the destruction. The fire, the smoke, you couldn't see the towers. We did not know at that point the towers were gone. We're trying to go across um, to the other side. I think I'm going to Brooklyn where I can wait, walk home. <laughs> and You're ready we, to be home. To, we were going to New Jersey and I oh. did not know that. We were going to Bayonne, New Jersey. So um, I looked to the left. And the city is in, in utter smoke. I look to the right, I see the Statue of Liberty and I turn around and sat down on the, the boat floor. And I said to Jen, I said, I'm gonna have another asthma attack. She goes, um, you better learn to breathe because there's no oxygen on this boat. That's the last thing I remember hearing her say until we got over to New Jersey. And the next thing I knew, I was being picked up by no neck and no neck on a dock and being dragged. And I said to the guys, I said, I think I'm going to throw up. They dropped me. Really? And they dropped, you? They dropped me on the dock. Because <laughs> so, you were going to throw up? Yeah, because I was going to throw up. Yeah, throwing up is not very pleasant, but, you I know, so it's okay. They put me in an ambulance and then Jen was in the front of the ambulance and they were loading people up. And I'm thinking, I'm going to a Brooklyn hospital. <laughs> no, I wasn't going. I was going to Bayonne, New Jersey hospital. So at that point, um, Jen says, my phone doesn't work. And I said, okay, well, try my phone. My phone worked the whole day. 
So we were able to call everybody that we needed to call. Mm -hmm. So Jen had called her family and told them we were fine, had called, you know, our, um, our uh, supervisor uh, to let him know that we were okay and that we were in an ambulance somewhere. <laughs> we were all right. Right. But we, we were alive. We were, we were okay. Well, little yeah. did I know I was not okay, but. Uh -huh. um, what was your injury? They thought I ruptured my spleen. Oh. So I had injured my thumb, my wrist, my shoulder, my back. <laughs> I was a mess. Um, everything on my left side from the debris that hit me injured me. So to this day, I still have issues with it. Right. So, um, yeah, when we got to the hospital in Bayonne, they put us in with regular patients. And Jen kept on coming to my bed because I couldn't walk at that point. Um, I was in too much pain. And we didn't know what was going on, honestly, until we looked up on the TV and we saw our ambulance buried and I said to Jen I said was that our ambulance <laughs> she goes oh no you're seeing things I'm like okay so I put it out of my mind you know we saw ambulances buried you know it's okay there was an explosion so you know no big deal and nothing is processing at this point uh, I'm saying this is crazy it's like I'm sitting in debris and dust and everything else and they're taking my clothes off and and putting me in in a gown and i'm like no going home no, right. i'm going home. This. <laughs> i'm going home you know time is going by you're hearing jet planes and everything else and not thinking about that these are military planes that are flying over now yeah they shut off the tv so we couldn't see it mm -hmm. So at this point, Jen's like, well, Jamaica's sending, you know, a, a minivan over. So I'm going to go home. I said, you're going home. I'm going with you. So I told the nurse, I said, you better find that doctor and you better tell him I'm leaving. So finally, they brought me clothes and I said, I will sign the against medical advice. And our hospital is sending a van. And there's probably going to be medics on there so they can take the responsibility of taking care of me. So I signed the papers. We went down to the emergency room. We were waiting for the van. And at that point, Jen said, you've got to come with me. And I'm like, Jen, I barely can walk. She's got, you have to come with me. So out the emergency room of the hospital, down the block, up the parking garage, looking across at New York City. And she goes, what's missing? I said, what do you mean, what's missing? She goes, what do you see? I said, smoke. I see a bunch of smoke. I see a bunch of planes. I see helicopters. What, what are you telling me? She goes, look, Bonnie, what is missing? She must have said it five or six times until I said, Where's the towers? She goes, they're gone. I said, what do you mean they're gone? I watched these towers be built as a kid, looking across the bay in Long Beach to New York City, watching these being built. We were told they were invincible. She goes, they're gone. I said, okay, they're gone. So at that point, Jen had found a firefighter who lived in Queens and two civilians that lived in Queens and shoved them in the van. And then the guy in front's like, we're only supposed to take personnel. And it's like, well, they are personnel now, so let's go. So as we're coming back on the Verrazano Bridge, coming back into New York, we're told there's a threat of an oil tanker that's stalled on the bridge, blowing the bridge up. I said, okay. So we're watching as we're coming towards New York, we're, we're, we're watching, you know, the burning. You can see the fire because you can see everything. And I said, I asked, I said, 
can we keep the light on? Because <laughs> I really don't want to look at uh, outside. Yeah. So everybody agreed that we could leave the the van light on the back. And um, little did I know that would be the start of my fear of the darkness from being buried alive. Huh. So at that point, we get to Jamaica Hospital. They didn't take us directly to the ER. They put us in the auxiliary building so they could debrief us. Mm-hmm. And uh, we're like, what is going you were on? Injured. What happened? Yeah, I, I said, what is going on? She's yeah. like, well, they're going to they're gonna debrief us. And I'm like, debrief us? It's like, I'm in pain. Yeah. I said, there's a guy with an Uzi walking around. And what's going on? At that point, chaos is happening at Jamaica Hospital because they are the primary receiving hospital. And at this point, they were manned by New York City police and military. Because if there was a threat, you know, we were going to be protected. And I still didn't know everything that was going on. So the nurse comes back, finally gives me a treatment. And I'm like, I really am in a lot of pain. She goes, what happened? I said, I don't know. I said, everything hurts on my left side. She goes, okay, I'll be back. So Jen comes a little while longer after that and says to me, I'm going home. I said, go home, call my grandmother, call my mother, call whoever. I said, let them know that we're all okay. Slowly it's sinking in that- You're not. There's an explosion. There's no more towers. I'm injured. She's going home. I'm not going home. Yeah. And the pain just started getting excruciating. So I told the nurse, I said, I really do need to um, get hold of someone so they know that I'm alive. It's like, can't do it right now. Can't do it right now. And there's people going back and forth. And all of a sudden, I see one of the guys that I knew from Rockville Center Fire Department that my father knew. And I'm like, stretch, stretch, stretch. It's like, who is that? And it's like, it's Bonnie. It's like, what the hell are you doing here? It's like, I work in the city. He's like, where's your father? I said, I don't know. He's probably at the firehouse. I said, you need to let them know that I'm okay. I don't care if you go on the radio and say I'm alive, whatever. I said, but they need to know I'm okay. Do you still have your spleen? I still have my spleen. Yes, I do. I do. Yes, I didn't puncture my spleen. I I messed up my ribs pretty good. Mm -hmm. When I finally woke up, my grandmother says, do you know what's going on? And I said, yeah, there was an explosion and supposedly the towers are gone. And she goes, they're all gone. I just spent the next almost month going to doctors and being evaluated for every injury that I have. Um, My injuries are two pages long from Mm 9-11. And to this day, yes, 9-11 still does affect my life. Um, The PTSD is somewhat better from the treatments that I've received. I actually had to have my uh, thumb and wrist reconstructed from the injury. Um, I had to have uh, my elbow. Um, I had surgery on there. I still suffer from um, neck, back, shoulder, leg injury, you know, the aftermath of the hit, getting hit by the debris. When the women who wrote uh, the book, Women at Ground Zero, mm-hmm. Um, actually interviewed me. It was a it was a culmination of stories. It wasn't my story. It wasn't my history. And it, it's it's weird because uh, as much as people think I'm like outward going and everything else, I'm very shy. <laughs> well, how's your life today? Who is you are my sunshine? I see that in the back. Oh my, that is my wife. Uh, <laughs> my wife loves sunflowers. 
and uh, she's been a saving grace. Uh, Tracy and I are married almost seven years now. Congratulations. And uh, she has been the beam of light in my life. Mm -hmm. um, the compassion, the patience that this woman has because she got me way after uh, in the relationship. I had gone through many relationships after 9-11 and the, the PTSD was just too bad. I couldn't it's really hard for you to really attach and trust. Yeah, I couldn't yeah. sustain anything between injuries, the asthma, the ailments, uh, the nightmares, the PTSD. Um, yeah, it wasn't happening. Tracy came into my life um, through a mutual spiritual women's group. So this is where the, in, the interfaith comes in. Uh -huh. So I had, a disaster ministry. I thought that was interesting. The, the disaster ministry is like Florida. Mm -hmm. If there's a disaster, a bunch of uh, ministers and chaplains are sent down there as comfort. Mm -hmm. So <clears throat> Tracy um, is a blessing. That's all I can say. I was searching for me. Because, right. you know, the Bonnie before 9-11 was not the Bonnie that came out. Because I used to sing soprano in <laughs> choir, and now I was singing a men's, man's tenor. So my voice you hear now was much higher. So, so you um, sent that. Uh, where did I see the song you wrote, the poem you wrote? Oh, the poem I wrote that's been... Right turned into a song right now. Um, yes, my wife is actually uh, going to be a co-creator in that. Know, and it's like really that. interesting when I write poetry, like I said, it's, it's cathartic, mm -hmm. but it just seems to stream through me. And I just, when I start a poem, I don't finish it until it's finished. So I could start a poem and it could be hours later when it's finished. But I, I don't stop that stream of consciousness when I'm writing it uh, because right. I'm feeling the emotion of it. Mm -hmm. I'm trying to make it as clear and paint a picture uh, when, I, when I write. Because if you can't identify something, you can't connect to it. So I really... The second seminary I went to, I really dove deep about what my beliefs and understanding about a power greater than ourselves and the different cultures, the way the similarities of what we do in our rituals, whether it's in church, temple, um, I, in a, in you know, all over the all over the world, and I found solace. I've been given more than one chance to sit and make a difference. Okay. <laughs> so, yeah, uh, I, I look at my life and, and people say you're a walking miracle. And I just, I don't, I don't identify that way. Um, you know, when people call me a hero, I don't identify as a hero. I went to work that day. I went and did my job. I was trained professionally. Thank God I had the background in EMS and the volunteer fire department before I entered as a professional emergency service worker. So everything leads up to where I am today with <laughs> being an interfaith minister and going on further to become a disaster chaplain because I've always been of service. And if you're of service, you not only benefit from it, but people are helped. And, you know, it says in the Bible, one hand washes the other. You know, we, we have commandments in the Bible, you know, or the, the, the Talmud or 
you know, half the texts that are written around the world, it's like humanity has to help one another because we can't survive by ourselves. And that's really something that we really need to ponder with not only the disasters from the past, but the wars and the crises that are now. If you knew that you were going to uh, die shortly, how would you like to be remembered? It's so funny. Um, I've been blessed to be interviewed and, and in many books, one of them being Women at Ground Zero. I have that book. Um, and there's a lot of footage of me and I have my story at the the um, museum, you know, down at Ground Zero. For me, ultimately, my 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 perfect in my mind, my perfect living space or, or mm-hmm. living. Um, I always have challenges by living by the ocean or being in the mountains, and I think my time of the ocean is done, and. Um, my wife and I are looking to move to move to Colorado at some time or somewhere out west. And the slower pace and the quieter um, it is, the better I function. Not to say that I can't be out in society and and have friends and whatever, but I appreciate things much more than I used to. Um, seeing an eclipse, watching the stars, watching the moon, watching the rainstorms, watching the lightning, watching the tide come in and out, going to the how, beach. How do you want them. to be remembered? How do I want to be remembered? Um, I did my job. Mm-hmm. I would do it again. I like that. I would. Mm-hmm. I loved my job. Didn't like the politics. But I love my job. Mm-hmm. I've always helped people throughout my life. I can't think and, of a better person. Yeah, I become and, a disaster minister. Really, I, am, I mean that a, dis- a disaster chaplain. That's what they call mm-hmm. them. <laughs> I, I, mean, I think I, I think I qualify. <laughs> you do. That's right. More than you know, you ha- you not only have to have empathy for others, but you have to have empathy for yourself. Mm-hmm. And I, I've grown a great deal not only through 9-11, but through my experiences, not only before 9-11, going to seminary, before seminary, after seminary. Um, I was blessed with an appreciation of nature and the resources that we have and the destruction that has happened because we've been careless. And I just don't want to be that person that is mean or careless with someone else not you you don't have to worry about it yeah yeah i i want to go to bed and sleep when i can with a clear conscience you know my my grandmother has always taught me to be the best person that i can and surround myself with people who not only help me but we help each other so i'll see you again soon thank you all right thank you Uh, Bye. Bye, guys.